I thank you again for being in this wonderful house and this wonderful setting this morning. I want to give you the word of God and it's been a wonderful day in the Holy Spirit this morning. Who's been feeling, who felt his presence this morning? I feel his presence this morning and I'm so grateful that the Lord's presence is in this house even now. And I thank him because he's helping me as I preach this word of God today. Those who may be watching live streaming, those who may be watching on my gladtidings.com, this, uh, .org, this, this message is for you today also. And I want this message to encourage you. And it's a message that the Lord gave to me. I didn't realize that he gave to me. When I preach a message, I, all I just say is, yes, Lord. And I start reading the word of God and he leads me to a scripture. It leads me to a message to preach. And I want to give this to you today. And I thank God for his leading. Today I want to preach on the great significance of the veil. The great significance of the veil. And I haven't preached this too much often here. Unless the Lord lets me do that. But I want to talk about the great significance of the veil this morning. I, I thank God for this message because it lets me not just preach about the veil, but it pre let me preach about Jesus. It lets me brag. It lets me boast about Jesus Christ this morning. And I want to give you some words about the significance of the veil. Again, if you are watching on the sound of my voice, Outside of this house, this message belongs to you too. The great significance of the veil. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 26, verses 31 through 33. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. Exodus 26, 31 through 33 says... And you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their books shall be gold upon, their, upon four sockets of silver. I'm sorry here. Their hooks shall be gold upon their four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the claps. You shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you, the holy place and the most holy. Matthew 27, 51 says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, and the earth quake, and the rocks were split. Dear Jesus, we thank you this morning for your loving kindness and tender mercies. I thank you for this word of God. Lord, we honor you and praise you because of how great you are. Thank you for tearing the bell, and thank you for an opening for us to see you directly. Father, I praise you and honor you for this word today, for your people. I pray for these people, those who are watching today, those who are in this house. Lord, I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours today. Anoint these lips of clay and bless me to preach your word the way you want me to. In your precious name, because you're my strength this morning. And we honor you and give you thanks and praise and bless this word. Amen. Amen. Let me read. Those verses, verses 31 through 33 of Exodus chapter 26, one more time. It says, you shall make a, well, a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall bring it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon the four sockets of silver. You shall hang the veil from the claps. You shall bring the ark of the testimony in there. Behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most 
holy. There was a famous and well-known theologian and philosopher named Augustine. He, he was referring to the Bible as he was writing, and he said, and I quote, he said, the new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. He, he's referring to the fact that many items and, and people in the Old Testament serve to point ahead to things more clearly revealed in the New Testament. This was the ideal in Paul's mind when he said in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, he said, now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So what I'm trying to say is that in the Old Testament, there are many objects that point ahead to the truths more fully revealed in the New Testament. For instance, we know that the brazen serpent in Numbers 21 was a type of the Lord Jesus. That's in John chapter 3. We also know that the manna of Exodus 16 was also a type of the picture of Jesus Christ. That's in John also. And there are many more examples that are so numerous to name, but I think you get the point here. And I want you to get the point here. Of all the types of the Old Testament, none is richer in symbolism than the tabernacle. From one end to the other, the tabernacle is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the redemption that believers believe in today. On this Sunday morning, I would like to focus our attention on the veil of the tabernacle. This article of great significance contains a great message for those who are willing to see it. And I want you to see this today. This veil is a wonderful type of Jesus Christ. In fact, it is specifically a picture of Jesus and his work while he was here in the flesh. Hebrews 10 and 20 says this, By a new and living way, which he consecrated, consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. With that in mind, let's spend some time looking at the veil and what it represents. Let me read verses 31 through 33 again. It says, you shall make a well woven, a, make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon their four sockets of silver. And you shall bring the veil from the clasps. And you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. Now, the patterns of the veil. The colors used in the veil. See, often the colors in the Bible are symbolic in nature. The colors used in the veil of the tabernacle are no exception. And, and, and these colors paint a picture or representation of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and what he will always be. First color was blue, the blue, blue. The color blue is the color of the sky. It, it, it reminds us of the heavenly beginning and origin of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. Romans 8 and 3 says, And for what the law could not do in, in, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did it by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great in the mystery of godliness, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, 
seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. And then there's the color scarlet. And I'm not skipping purple, uh, purple for a moment to show and so you prove a point here. The color scarlet, this is the color of blood. And it speaks of Jesus as the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice of sins of man. And then there's purple. This is the color of royalty, and it reminds us that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice, with judgment and the justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord hosts will perform this. And as we were praising the Lord, this other verse came to me in Revelations 19 and 16 when he's going to be coming back. And he says, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Folks, we're going to be seeing that when he comes down. Now, 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 here's why I skip purple. Purple is made by blending equal amounts of red and blue. Jesus Christ is a perfect blend of God and man. He's 100% both at the same time. And we can see that in New Testament here. So what was the material cloth used in the veil? It was pure. It was a white linen. That was used for the veil. This speaks of the purity of the Lord Jesus. It reminds us that he was sinless. Verse Peter 2.22 says, Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And then what kind of construction? What was the construction? How it was used in the veil? Notice that the cloth was to be fine twine or finely woven of cunning work or artistic design. This tells us that the cloth used was to be a special weave. It would be different from any other cloth. So it, w- so it was with Jesus. There's never been another man like him. <laughs> I can stop right there, but I won't. There's never been another man like him. And in this person, he was the perfect blend of deity and humanity. He is the God man. He is unique for he is God in the flesh. You know, John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Philippians 2, 5 and 8 says, let this mind be in you in which you also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Oh my goodness. I'm I'm so... uh, Woo! But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. I'm talking about God and man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You You know what? I can stop right there. How the veil reveals reveals and what about Jesus and who he is. But there's more message to this veil. And I want you to be encouraged this morning because I'm so excited about this. So, so, So what was the purpose of the veil. So some people ask me, ask me what was the purpose of the veil? Well, let me give you some reasons. 
is served as a warning. This veil was hung between the holy place where the priest ministered every day. And, 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 and this may be a review for some of you, but let me tell you something. It's always good to be refreshed. And the holy of holies, uh, where the presence of God dwelt above the mercy seat, is served as a barrier between holy God and sinful man. They were told to repair the veil with cherubim on it. The cherubim are angelic beings that served as the guardians of the holiness of God. They were first seen, if you know your Bible, they were first seen in Genesis chapter 3 verse 24, which says, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the, gar east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. They were positioned at the entrance of Eden to prevent man from gaining access to the tree of life. And guess what? They are still there today. No one can enter into the Garden of Eden because you got some guardians there. And I dare you try to go up against them too. The presence of the cherubim on the, on, the veil seemed, on the veil seemed to serve the purpose of telling those who entered the tabernacle that they would come this far but no further. They were a constant reminder that access to God was not permissible and forbidden. God is holy. Man is a sinner. Therefore, the cherubim were placed there to warn all who approached the veil to continue, that, that to continue to go through was to invite judgment and death. They were reminded, every person, every human being, that a holy, sinless God abided and dwelled just behind the veil. But you know what? What marvelous grace and tender mercy that God would warn people not to come into his presence in their sinful condition. See, see, the cherubim were there to warn mankind, but they were also serving to protect men and preserve their life. That's a merciful God. It also served as a wall. This veil served as a barrier between God and man. It shut, out the pre it shut man out of the presence of God. Leviticus 16 and 2 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil. Before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So between the sinner and God, there is a great wall standing. Isaiah 59 and 2 says, But your iniquities have, re have separated you from your God, and your sins have has hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Listen. Sin offends our holy God. And separates us from him because God is holy. He cannot ignore, excuse, or tolerate sin as though it didn't matter. Sin cuts people off from him. Forming a wall to isolate God from the people he loves. Hey, you know what? We cannot approach God within ourselves. Let me say that again if you're listening. We cannot approach God within ourselves. To do so invite would invite judgment and death. Before man can enter into the presence of God, sin must first be dealt with. And let me tell you also, the veil served as a way. While this, ver while this veil served to keep men out, there was one day during the year when one man can enter. And on that day of atonement, the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. But only with the blood of a sacrificial lamb. 
Leviticus 16 and 15 says, Then he shall kill the goat of sin offering, which is for the people. Bring his blood inside the veil. Do that with blood as he did with the blood of the bull. And sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. On that day, the high priest, what he would do was he was allowed around the inside of the veil and minister into the Holy of Holies, sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice on the altar and atoning for the sins of the people. It was the only time anyone was allowed behind the veil. I just want to remind you that the blood is the only way anyone has access to the presence of God. Who knows that this morning? Hebrews 10, 19 to 20 says, Therefore, brethren, have, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. Bloodless, Christ, Christless religion will never save the human soul. Those who try to get God without the blood of Jesus will find themselves in hell. Oh, you got quiet on me. Those who try to get to God without the blood of Jesus will find themselves in hell. Because there's no other method God will accept. To enter his presence, you must be born again. And the only way to be born again is through the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen. A slave back in those days was redeemed when someone paid money to buy his or her freedom. God redeemed us from the tyranny of sin. Not with money, but with the precious blood of his own son, Jesus. See, we cannot escape from sin on our own. Only the life of God's Son can free us. And I want this message to encourage you today. You know why? Because we who know Jesus as our personal Savior and Redeemer can say that he's the best thing that ever happened to us. Who can say that this morning? Thank, 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 thank God. Thank God that Jesus made the way for us to enter into his presence by going to the cross for our sins. And then the veil served as a witness. While the, the, the high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies one time each year, the priest ministered in the holy place every day of the year. As they did, they came within inches of the veil, but never allowed to go past it. It was a constant reminder to them that they were sinners and that they were separated from God. It was a constant reminder of man's moral flop and failure. So it is with the ministry of Jesus in the flesh. You know, there's a lot of people who try to copy the life of Jesus in an effort to secure their salvation. However, what men fail to realize, what people fail to realize is that, they, that, that he lived a perfect life and never once sinned against his father or the law. I put that in. His father and the law. He did what you did. Well, let me, tell, let me put it this way. He did what you and I could never do. He lived a perfect life without sin. In John 15 and 22, Jesus said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Listen, folks, he's the glory of God and that all of us have fallen short of that glory. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. So, so, so in the final analysis, this veil serves to remind all humankind, man, woman, boy or girl, Jew or Gentile, what they, that they are, sin, they are sinners in need of a Savior and that they will never be able to approach God on their own merits. Folks, I don't care what we have done. I don't care what we have done so good, we cannot reach God because of our good deeds, not because of our merits, not because of who we are, what level of school you've done. I don't care if you are a doctor or what. You had a doctor or a master's degree. If you're a sinner, you won't go to heaven. You can't approach God. What about the parting of the veil? Matthew 27 and 51 says this. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, <clears throat> and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. How was the veil parted in two as we go further into the New Testament? Notice that it was God and not man that parted the veil. While the priests were offering the even sacrifice, Jesus was offering his life as a ransom for sin. When the innocent one died for the guilty ones, the veil split from top to bottom. Man had nothing to do with it. It was the work of God alone. And I'm at the cross now. I'm thousands of years later. This word is being fulfilled. This word is being fulfilled when Jesus is on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was 60 feet high. It was 30 feet wide. It was said to have been four inches thick. It was so heavy that Josephus said that 300 priests were required to move it. It also says that two teams of oxen would not have been able to tear it or rip it apart. What man could never do. I want you to get this now. What man could never do, God did by his power. Would have been an awesome sight to see that veil split, torn in half. The same is true with the salvation we enjoyed this morning. We had nothing to do with it at all. It originated with our sovereign God in heaven before the world was even formed. Revelations 13 and 8 says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Listen, it was carried out at Calvary without our help. It was carried out with the brutal death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation was and is the work of a sovereign God. Thank you, Jesus. And, 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 and what was the message of the tearing or rending of the veil? This message was torn, this message of the torn veil is crystal clear. And I, let, let me tell you what it tells us. It tells us that the way of God is now open. It's, it's, it's open. Remember, he, the veil is torn, it's ripped apart, and there's a wide highway straight to God. I can imagine a priest of the temple trying to sew sewing the part veil back together and continuing on in their vain religion, not realizing that now that the way to God is open to all, open to everyone, not just one day per year, but all the time, all the time. Ooh, boy, that makes me happy. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Lord. That'll make you lift your hands and say hallelujah, folks. Thank you, Lord. Let me give you some good news out of the word of God. Ephesians 2, 11 through 18 says this, and keep this. 
He says, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, uh, circumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. That at that time you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And then lets us know that Christ is our peace. Verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down. Get this. He has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished it in his flesh, the enmity that is the law. The law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. Here's the clincher. For through him, we both have access to one spirit, to the Father. And what was the majesty of the veil splitting? Because the way, and get this now, because the way has been opened into the presence of God, whosoever will can come into his presence and have access to God himself. Revelation 22 and 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The veil, the curtain, separating the holy place from the most holy place, the, the, separating the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two at Christ's death, symbolizing that the wall or the barrier between God and humanity was removed. Now all people, everyone, are free to approach God because of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. Praise and glorify the Lord that the way to God has been forever opened for you and for me. Let me give you some more good news from this word. Hebrews 9, 1 through 14, and bear with me on this. Let me talk about the early sanctuary. It says... Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer in the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. Hallelujah. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first tabernacle, performing the services. But to the second part, the high priest went along once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard of the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. But 
Let me talk about the heavenly sanctuary. Verse 11 says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, but that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of, of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying, flesh, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve this living God. So, 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 so what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is there's no more veil. There's no more wall or barrier to stop us. There's no more go between such as an earthly human man or woman that we, we need to confess our sins to. And there's no one earthly or human that we have to face to relay our supplications to God. So God will get him. Now. Someone say now. Come on, say it again. Now. Now in Jesus we can come before our Father anytime. Come on, folks. Ephesians 3 and 12 says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. And an awesome, it is an awesome privilege to be able to approach God with freedom and confidence. Most of us would be fearful and hesitant in the presence of a powerful ruler. But, but, but thanks to Christ Jesus, by faith we can enter directly into God's presence through prayer. Hallelujah. We know we'll be welcomed with open arms. Just like Stephen was when he saw Jesus on the right hand of God, he stood for Stephen like you said, welcome son. Welcome. We know we'll be welcomed with open arms because we are God's children through our union with Jesus. Listen, listen, listen. Don't be afraid of our Lord. Talk with him about anything and everything. He's waiting to hear from you. Ah. I hate to end this, but I'm going to end this right now. <laughs> As I end this today, oh, God, hallelujah. Folks, we got access to God. I don't have to go to a priest and say, Hail Mary. I don't have to pray to Mary. Hell, mother full of grace. No, 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 no. I can go directly to Jesus. I can go directly to Jesus. <laughs> uh, as, I, as I end this today, I'm trying to end, but I, I, I you know, if you're under the sound of my voice today, You know, when the, when the high priest entered behind the veil, he came into the very presence of God himself. He offered the blood and he had to leave. <laughs> and he was not allowed back until next year. How many know when we get in the presence of God, we don't have to leave? <laughs> we don't have. <laughs> we don't have to wait, folks. We can stay there as long as we want. He, he could never come back without, with, with, without blood, and he could not come when he wanted to, but only when God allowed him to. However, when Jesus... <sighs> ooh, praise God. When Jesus came in the flesh and gave his life for you and me, 
He forever tore down that middle wall of partition. And he broke down all the barriers that stood between us and gave us free access to the Father. You know, one of my favorite gospel singers' name is Shirley Caesar. She sings a, call, a song called No Charge. The last verse of that song says, well, you know, when I think about that, I think about the day that Jesus went out to Calvary and gave his life as ransom for me. When I think of the words, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I like to think about the very minute that he shed his blood. My debt was paid in full. And I want you to know today when you, when you add it all up, the full cost of real love is no charge. Listen, there's no charge to come into the presence of God because you know what? He paid for our price of admission. He paid for the price of our mission. Hebrews 4 and 16 tells us, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What a glorious privilege we have. And, 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 and it's given to us because Jesus became the veil and was torn apart on Calvary so that we may have the right of way to God. Bless his holy name. And I thank God for Jesus. Before I end, and I want to appeal to some of you. Some of you may not know that Jesus who tore the veil today. But how many know you can? You can. Some of you who are watching have been running have been running other alternatives to give your life meaning and you're running from the Lord. We've got a lot of folks running today. Well, it's time to stop running and give your life to Him. You know, it's not hard to invite Jesus into your life. All you have to do is have sincerity in your heart. And, and all you just have to do is ask Jesus to come in and make a new creation out of your life for his glory. I got many testimonies in his house that you've been made into a new creation. Who can say that today? Yeah. You know what? The veil has been torn down for you. And now you have a chance to come into the presence of the Lord. And all you have to do is just pray a simple prayer of repentance with me. He'll make you into a new person. I got some testimonies in this house that, 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 that says that they have a new purpose in their life now. He can give you the same purpose. And plus, he can give you eternal life in him, not in the future, he can give it to you now because we all will be heaven bound. I thought about that group this morning called the Heaven Bound Travelers. They sing a song called Heaven Bound. Listen, our God, our Jesus is so awesome that one day he got on that cross and he didn't just confirm his death by dying for us and confirming that we have life. He let us see with our eyes how that veil, after that earthquake, tore down that veil. 
what no man could do. Jesus did it on the cross for you. And he opened up that full, gigantic access, that full, gigantic way to him. I don't have to go to a priest and say, forgive me, no. I don't have to give any Hail Marys. I don't have to do all that. I don't have to serve a penitence. All I have to do is just say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of what I've done. Make me a new creation. Give me purpose in my life. Give me a new way to walk and a new way of to talk. That's all you have to do is to ask Jesus with sincerity. So why don't you meet him now? Because you don't want to meet him later. <clears throat> if you listen to this word of God and you want to give your life over to Jesus, I ask you to bow your heads with me. And with sincerity, pray this prayer of repentance. The table is spread and the veil is open. His presence is open. Who in this house can say that I'm saved? Come on, who in this house can say that I'm saved this morning? Hallelujah. Everyone here who's redeemed of his blood will pray with you. And we're going to pray together. And if you're watching today from the sound of my voice, even if you need rededication, the Lord will bring you back. If you're thinking about taking your own life today, the Lord can give you new life. Let's pray. Say this with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for this moment in my life. Dear Lord, I need you in my life. I need a new walk. I need a new talk. I need, I need a new way to live. Only you can do that. You can give me that. And I need that in my life. Touch my heart. Make me a new person. Jesus, I want to live for you. And I need you now. And I say yes to your will and yes to your way. Please forgive me of my sins and my shame. Make me into a new person. Give me purpose. I love you, Father, for dying on the cross for me and tearing the veil down for me. And I know I have access to you because I'm sincere about coming to you and inviting you into my life. I thank you, Lord, for listening to my prayer, giving me new, cre new life and new purpose. And now, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me of my sins and making me into a new person. I will live for you forever and ever. And now, Lord, I know I have eternal life in you. I thank you for saving me. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. It's been a great